Hello everybody and welcome to today's lecture on MPI derived data types and virtual topologies. So a short overview of what we're going to discuss today. We're going to talk about, as the title suggests, derived data types, which are a means within MPI to send user specific types beyond the basic integer and floating point types that we've discussed so far. Um, afterwards we're going to discuss virtual topologies which add semantic information to ranks and allows you to get more information about the structure of your problem rather than just, um, I don't know, rank number 17 wants to talk to rank number 32. They might be neighbors to each other, but you can't get this kind of information from ranks. But there's a possibility to establish a sort of structure on your processes that talk to each other. And virtual topologies um, is the means of getting there with MPI. And afterwards, um, I want to just have uh, one or two slides about uh, Tales from the Pro Seminar, which is something that I did last year, was very successful, so I will try to continue it this year, where I will add information um, about specific topics that arose in the Pro Seminar. In this lecture, it's still going to be something that appeared last year, but uh, from this point on, whenever we encounter interesting issues in the Pro Seminar that I think are worth exploring further and giving you a little bit more information, um, I will try to include these in the next lecture. If you have suggestions for topics like that, for example, if I miss something uh, on Mondays, uh, please just let me know. Now I told you I like to give a short motivation as to why we talk about stuff. So, so far we discussed using MPI for parallelization and for distributing data for having multiple processes work on the same problem. But all of this was done on a very basic level. So at the moment we can only transfer contiguous ranges of arrays of the same element type. We can send a single array of a million integer elements, for example, or um, two million floating point elements, whatever. But this is everything we can do at the moment. Mm. Also, at the moment, if you talk uh, to your neighbor, for example, uh, for problems where you need to exchange information with your neighboring rank, say you have a two or three dimensional domain and you want to talk to the process that handles the data left next to you or right next to you, you manually need to compute rank numbers with some modular operation, for example. And um, this is both of these issues are sort of annoying, right? So what about, for example, coming back to the data types, what about transferring nested structs or classes? Say you have a program where you want to use the full feature set of C or C++, which is definitely more than just arrays of the same data type. You can have unions, you can have structs and so on, which usually carry more semantics than, than basic arrays and um, help you simplify your programming and try to have a really component-driven, modular-driven software development approach. Um, at the moment, we can't really handle those. We, I can't tell MPI, uh, send uh, a struct, send a few elements of a struct, and so on. Um, the second issue with the rank numbers um, relates to ease of coding. So if I need to exchange data with the neighbor that is left next to me, right next to me, or on top of me or below me, um, I want to actually specify that. I want to tell MPI I need to talk to whoever is above me. I don't want to try to compute ranks using some math formulas that are not too difficult, mind you. Of course, you can just compute this once, put it in the code and, and verify it and that's it. But still, say a year later, as you know, we always talk about productivity of the program as well. You need to read this code and you need to figure out what's going on. It's much easier to just read send temperature to left neighbor, for example, compared to send a double value, which might be anything, but in this case it's the temperature. And uh, the left neighbor is my rank minus one plus the number of ranks, modulo the number of ranks, and then you figure out, ah, if I tried it with a few numbers, it's actually always the left neighbor. So uh, we would like to carry more semantics here. Uh, first, let's come to the derived data types. So with derived data types, first let's do a short recap. Um, you know about the basic MPI data types, you probably already used them for those of you who already did some or at least part of the exercises. Um, we have integers, we have floats, we have doubles, all of those are predefined handles to tell MPI what kind of data we are transporting, we are transmitting. 
The problem is, um, what about something on the right? Say you have a physics simulation that allows you to simulate the flow of particles, whatever kind of particles they may be. You need to do this in three dimensions, so you have a position, x, y and z coordinates, double values in this case, and we have a species. Say, for example, we want to simulate the movement of both electrons and protons and neutrons or something like that, then we need to somehow specify what kind of particle that is. Now, this is a struct, obviously, with four members. Not too difficult, it's just plain C. And it's uh, three times eight bytes uh, for the doubles and uh, a four byte integer. So we can't transport this at the moment with MPI except for trying to manually compute the size of the particle, manually computing what's the size of an integer, for example, or we, we use MPI character for, or MPI byte for transferring simple bytes. And um, we can do that, but this doesn't carry really semantic information. This just tells MPI, tell, take the entire chunk of data transmit it, whatever it is, it's sort of a black box, we, we lose any hope of having MPI optimize the, the uh, message passing process, for example. So at this point, if we have a struct like that, MPI doesn't really know how large a single element is. There is no predefined handle for MPI underscore data type that doesn't exist yet, obviously. So this doesn't work. Then the second issue is what about nesting types? Say for example, I have this particle now, but the particle doesn't have X, Y, Z as positions, um, as, as plane elements on the same level, but it could have two substructs, one for the position and one for the velocity, for example, the velocity vector, which both would be X, Y, Z values. So in this case, we actually have nesting of structs. And uh, what, uh, as with the previous example, about differently sized members. So we have an integer with uh, four bytes, we have double values with eight bytes. Um, it's sort of difficult to do computations on those if you just transmit an overall data type of integers or, or doubles. You might need to add padding, for example, for, uh, for that to work. Um, you could simply send individual messages, right? You, we could just say, hey, this is a struct, I know it's four doubles and a single integer, so let's transmit four doubles in one send operation and let's transmit one integer in a second operation. And we do all of that for n number of times if I have n instances of this struct, for example. The problem is that this is a really bad idea. Um, first of all, it causes uh, really the code to blow up. Um, you have uh, overhead in terms of the number of messages that you need to exchange in, in written code just. So you need to write multiple send operations, their data types need to match. If you change something in the struct, then you need to update your send operations and so on. Uh, the memory footprint, inc footprint increases because you need to copy the data first into a buffer probably before you can use it. If I only want to transmit the position and not the species, or if I only want to transmit the spe uh, species but not the position, uh, you have to drop data that you don't want to have. And at the moment, we can only send contiguous data. So would I have to copy it first somewhere else? And this increases the memory footprint. It would be much better to just tell MPI, please just set, uh, send this select set of, of el elements of my struct and uh, do that without copying, if it's possible. It depends on the MPI implementation. But I will show you later on how that works. And um, this is so. This is bad in terms of coding style, and this is also bad in terms of uh, sending and receiving messages because we need at least one separate message per message type, unless we want to use uh, bytes as the type um, to transfer, so MPI character. Um, and sending multiple messages possibly incurs or entails um, additional latency that you don't want to have. If I can send multiple particles in a single send receive operation, then why would I use multiple of those? It's just uh, unnecessary overhead. Now, a little bit more detail as to why we don't just use MPI byte or int or something else everywhere. Um, because you could uh, say, okay, that, that sounds like not the best solution, but it would work, right? And the idea is, well, yes, it would work probably. You would, would have to write additional boilerplate code to make sure that the padding works, cut away data that you don't need, you might transmit more data than necessary and so on, but it's nothing stops you really from doing it. The problem is there's really no strong typing here. There's no, no type handling. The problem is um, 
we have these defined data types because for example the size of an integer is unknown the c standard only defines a minimum requirement a re minimum requirement of the minimum uh, number range that needs to fit in this data type there's nothing that prevents you from working on a system for example or prevents you from using mpi on a system where integer is actually eight bytes by default and not four bytes uh, which can happen and um, this might be an issue so by having mpi int um, by having the handle of, of telling MPI this is an integer data type, uh, this allows you to have a um, high-level view of the data type without specifying the exact size and letting the MPI implementation decide depending on the system. So what that gives you is, for example, we could change from machine A to machine B when exchanging a message that have different sizes. You could have one system, for example, that is a 64-bit machine where integers are, I don't know, four-byte integers, and uh, you could have another really exotic system where uh, integer is, is much more, which would be eight uh, bytes or 16 bytes or whatever. If we use MPI int for that, we don't have to care. Mind you, you still have to care about this in the rest of your code, but at here we're only talking about um, the MPI uh, cores that you have to make. It's just a little bit less complexity that you have to deal with. Um, further difference might be that uh, one machine might be little Indian, the other one might be big Indian. I, this is something that probably doesn't appear that much nowadays, uh, because most clusters are um, homogeneous uh, or supercomputers are homogeneous at least with respect to the CPU type that they use. It could be that you have more main memory, you have GPUs, you don't have GPUs, you have more numbers of cores or something, but the basic CPU model is usually always the same. Uh, but still MPI doesn't prevent you from doing that. It helps you to do stuff like that if you want to. And it also saves you a lot of explicit user-written size of constructs, right? Because I don't need to, if I want this portability and I don't have the MPI handles, I would have to compute the size of every data type every time I do a send and receive, because I don't know which machine I'm running on. And um, with the MPI handles, you don't have to do that. And also what's very important, and you remember, I already mentioned that for other topics and it will keep coming up, by telling MPI more about the code, in this case about the data type that you're transmitting, you enable type-specific hardware optimizations. It might be possible that there's a send operation that is really fast, or a broadcast or a gather operation that is really fast for integers, but for that to work, MPI needs to know that you are transmitting integers, and it will not work for floating point numbers, for example. Uh, things like that are possible, so we need to tell MPI about that. And if you use MPI byte or something else that's not really representing the data, um, this deprives you of all of the features above that you get. And something else that I want to mention that is not on the slides, um, I'm also a huge fan of being able to read code and read the code fast. I think I already told you the best source code comments are the ones that you do not have to write because the code is self-explanatory. So in this case this also applies. If I transmit integers of floating point values and the type is just a byte array or something, this doesn't tell me anything about the data. If I transmit integers or if I transmit floating point numbers and I know my application deals with various data types, I can immediately know this cannot be a certain type because I use integers to represent that and I would never transmit uh, this using a floating point type. So, uh, or the other way around, say for example, I know all of the positions of my particles, all the positions are always represented as floating point numbers. If I see an MPI float send operation, I know that probably we're talking about particle positions here, right? This is information that you can sort of add to the code just while programming if you do it right. Now, what's the solution to all of that? Uh, we want structs, we want more complex data types and so on. MPI offers so-called derived data types for that. Derived data types are types that are composed of existing data types. Uh, you can base them on both basic types and also derived types, so you can also nest derived types as much as you want to. And they are mainly used for transmitting high-level data structures. Because, as I said, it encodes more information in the transfer. It allows MPI to do optimizations. If we only transmit every second element of a struct or of an array or something, MPI might be doing something special in order to speed that up. Um, it's more performance efficient uh, even in that sense that we don't have to do individual transfers. Even if you do single send operations for individual elements for example, MPI might be able to buffer those depending on the size, remember we talked about that, but um, nevertheless 
it's probably hard to beat the efficiency of MPI when you tell it this is everything I want to transmit with those semantics just do it as best as possible and you leave it up to the developer of the MPI implementation to get this right and overall as I keep stressing it's less code it's easier to rent, uh, read and it's easier to maintain which is always a nice thing to have especially if you have to read your own code again uh, one year later so um, how does this work with derived data types? What you do is you essentially define new handles, for example, MPI foobar, like here, which could be any type and it would be really stupidly names, named, so please don't do that, but uh, just as an example. And in order to get this handle, we need several steps. First of all, we need to construct the data type, which means declare and define what it is. Then we need to commit it, which is important. You need to commit a data type before you are allowed to use it. And this needs to be done by every rank that wants to use this new data type before you can use it in any send or receive operation. Um, uh, committing is important because that allows to f MPI to finalize this data type and sort of start an optimizing process where MPI can have a look at what you assembled so far and try to find a really optimized way of transmitting that kind of data. And that happens upon committing the data type. Um, then, of course, usage, which I marked as optional, but there's no sense in uh, actually creating the data type and committing the data type if you're not going to use it later on. But there's nothing uh, preventing you from, uh, for example, having conditionals on that. And if you construct and commit a data type that you're not using, this is not an error, of course. This doesn't do anything. And deallocation, which is also optional, which is the MPI free. But uh, you should do that, um, I think I mentioned this already in the past, try to free any kind of storage that you allocated dynamically, um, just as you would call a free if you call the malloc or a delete if you do the, did a new. Uh, you also want to free the internal storage of MPI when using derived data types because uh, first of all there will be some kind of limit so if you use lots of derived data types at some point you will probably hit some maximum buffer size or something that stores uh, your your data type structures so it doesn't store the actual data but actually the the all the types that you have available and um, this type information should be freed once you don't need it any longer and also it f um, increases the the ease of debugging when you want to check memory leaks in your program you want to verify that there are no memory leaks and so on just free the data that you allocated so you won't run into false positives now there are several um, functions that you can use with MPI to create different kinds of derived data types. We're not going to talk about all of them. I just selected four here that are sort of interesting to, to have a look. They are probably the most basic ones and simultaneously the ones that are most used. Um, they can be used for creating a struct, for example, which is the first one, uh, which essentially just lets you specify what does your struct look like, what's the order and size of the individual elements. Then we have vector, which allows you to uh, send strided data. So you could, for example, send only every second or every third element of an array, which you can't do with normal send operations. Uh, then there is subarray, which allows you to specify subranges of multidimensional arrays. Say you have a two-dimensional domain and you only want to send or receive a certain block, then you can just address this single block by creating a subarray with it. And there's MPI uh, type contiguous which specifies a user-defined contiguous type, as I said here, comparable to C arrays. And this might seem strange to you, because why would we need something like that? You can already tr transmit contiguous data types, right? So you just do a normal send operation, you give the start address, the type, and the size, or the, the number of elements, rather, to transfer. Why do we need a type contiguous, which is doing just exactly that same thing? And I will tell you later on. In the meantime, maybe you can think about it a little bit if uh, maybe you... Um, get what I'm getting at. So, um, first let's focus on structs. In order to create structs, we need to call the MPI type create struct um, function. Uh, it takes a number of parameters. I'm gonna go through these uh, API calls and, and the description of the functions more quickly as we progress through the lecture because you're gonna get used to how stuff works in MPI and in one of the later slides in this lecture set already I think I don't even have this kind of slide where I tell you exactly the parameters and what they do because this information you can also read up on a man page. In the beginning I try to give you more information and as we move on I will start to drop the most basic things that you could also read up on the internet I guess. If at some point you think it's too confusing or there's information missing, let me know. If you think this is too verbose and this is clear anyway, please also let me know. 
Um, now, for the first parameter is the number of blocks that we transmit. Uh, the second parameter is the number of elements per block, um, which is an array, of course, because you might have multiple blocks that you transmit. So the first parameter is just the size of the, the elements uh, block length, for example, and the displacement array also. Uh, displacements is the starting address of the first element of each block and don't worry you don't have to really memorize this now on the next slide you will see a source code example where you see the exact kind of information that is required for that it's pretty straightforward in my opinion and uh, the last parameter that's uh, important here is the type of each block which is also an array and which would be uh, doubles integers and so on and uh, new type is an out parameter which should be obvious because it's actually a pointer and uh, taken by sort of reference so to speak in C and not uh, by copy and this simply gives you um, the handle to your new derived data type that you just created so what does this look like for actual code on the left uh, again we have our struct particle in this case now we uh, have different elements we have three integers for position x y and z and we have uh, three double values which are uh, which is a force vector actually for some magnetic force this is taken out of some uh, particle in cell physics simulation so it used to be real world code it's just uh, reduced by a lot <laughs> in this case uh, for presenting on the slides and uh, to show you what these block lengths, displacement and type looks like, we have two blocks here, number one, uh, and number zero and number one. Uh, block zero starts at byte zero, obviously, so byte zero of every struct particle. It's 12 bytes long because we have three integers and every integer has four bytes on our system and the type is integer. Uh, and then we have a second block, uh, which is number one with uh, the starting point at byte 12. It's 24 bytes long and the type is double. So quite clear I would say. Um, now regarding the displacements you have to be careful because with the displacements you simply give the starting address or the starting addresses that you have for your blocks and you could just try to compute this manually because you know integers on my system are four bytes I'm only gonna use uh, I don't know uh, the, the system that I'm currently working on um, is not gonna change in terms of how how large an integer is or how lo large a float or double value is and you could just manually compute this and put it hard coded in your array like you see um, on the top uh, in the code example on the right. The problem is that this is a very bad idea. The binary layout of your struct is uh, in part compiler dependent. So your compiler might decide to do some packing, might decide to do some padding, could for example pad every member to 8 bytes and then integers are displaced further than you would assume them to be and if you do this manually and even if you figure it out correctly with the current configuration that you're using you might be getting it wrong later on when you for example change your compiler or when you change your entire hardware platform so the much much better idea to do this is to use offset off because that's what it's for uh, simply call offset off with the struct type that you um, want to query and the element identifier that you want to query and offset off will give you this exact number and it will do so correctly every time this code is compiled no matter what the platform is. Don't try to get this right manually. Also um, again readability offset off is pretty clear about I, I think the name is pretty clear about what it intends to do what the purpose of this function is. If I see some array somewhere in your code that might not ca be called displacements or it might just be called temp or d or some other stupid name that doesn't tell me much and there are just some numbers in it i have to start to go through the code and see where is this used for a send operation what's the buffer that i want to send what's the type of this buffer ah, it consists of structs what is the padding and the offset and displacement of the struct ah it matches the numbers in this array so probably that's what's connected and so on don't do that, just use offset off because the identifiers are in the function call here and you immediately know what it's referring to and what it should do. The second thing you have to be careful with are pointers because what we're talking about here essentially are shallow copies. So um, if I transmit uh, this particle for example on the right which again has a different signature, assume this time it's an integer with a size and um, of some array and then we have a pointer to the starting point of this array for example if you transmit this particle with MPI, what you get is the transfer of a single integer and a single pointer, and that's it. And um, unless you encode this yourself, obviously, this is not going to be a deep copy, so data will not be copied. 
First of all, if you do something like that, try to avoid it anyway. Try to uh, use higher level structures that do not work with plain pointers. Try to, for example, work with uh, C++ and simply, simply query objects for their sizes. Uh, query a, a vector with uh, the, the accessor for the raw data in order to get this and tr uh, transmit it via uh, MPI. If you have to do something like that anyway, if you have linked lists or something like that, and there's really no way to um, encode your problem more efficiently in source code, then just you have to make a deep copy and make sure that you fix the point at the receiving side. Because otherwise, if you transmit this, the same particle might exist somewhere on the receiving side, for example, but the pointer to data might be a completely different value because we are in a completely different memory address space. So be careful with uh, deep versus shallow copies. Now, a small code example of how struct uh, creation in MPI can be used. Um, we have a struct here that's uh, called type with an integer and two doubles with some yeah fictitious names, fictional names. Uh, we create a new data type, my type for example. We specify the array of block lengths. Um, we uh, specify the array, declare and define the array with displacements uh, using offset off, as I said before. And um, here we can see that offset off, for example, is the first uh, the first parameter is the starting point of the integer, which is the first block, and then we have the second block, which consists of doubles, and uh, the starting point is the first double value here. Um, then we declare our element uh, array that holds the, the element types, which are MPI int and MPI double. And once we uh, have all of all these components um, on the top right, you can see the call to create struct where I simply tell MPI, I want to create this now. Um, I have two blocks, so the, the length of the following arrays that give me the structure information is two. Um, if we were in C++, that wouldn't be necessary, as you know, um, but it is. And um, we then give as parameters the block lengths, the displacements, the data types, uh, and uh, the out parameter, so to speak, my type, which then will be configured to be using that whenever I use my type. And then what we do is just normal send and receive operation. So for example, we declare an array data of type foo with two elements, and then I just use this array in a send operation. I tell MPI, I want to send, for example, two elements, and the elements are of type my type, and MPI will be doing exactly what we wanted to do, namely transmit two elements of this type struct. And this code is much shorter than anything you would probably come up with otherwise. Um, two small notes here. First of all, uh, you might be noticing something here in the source code. Again, you might not be. Uh, but uh, I wasn't a very good programmer when uh, I put this on the slides because I'm missing the free. There's no type free here. So I have to somewhere at the end of the slides, I think, uh, or somewhere in between, I don't know, that uh, the free is partially missing from these slides because uh, of the space requirements. And I hope it's sufficient for me to tell you that you should always free your data types. Just like if I do a malloc or something on the slides, there might not always be a free. Um, but don't take this as good practice that uh, Philip didn't put uh, type free on his slides, so I don't have to either. No, you should. The second thing that I want to mention here is coming back to the C versus C++ topic that we have to specify the length of the arrays that we give create struct as arguments uh, because that's how C works. You just give a pointer because uh, arrays, uh, um, maybe some of you don't know this, but arrays degrade to pointers in function calls in C. That's why we can't really query an array for its size once it's been passed inside a function. And um, in C++, obviously, this is not an issue. So the question is, are there C++ uh, function bindings for MPI. Is there a C++ a uh, API for MPI? And the answer, unfortunately, is not anymore. There used to be a C++ API, which was sort of nice to use and which works around these issues to let you really write high-level C++ code without having to defer to getting raw pointers of the underlying data and getting the size of the uh, array that this pointer points to and so on and so on. And the support for this was dropped. Um, not sure, it might still be in some MPI implementations, but the standard deprecated the C++ bindings and um, you're stuck with C, unfortunately. So now we know about structs. What about the remaining types that we can transfer? Um, let's talk about non-contiguous data. We have an array, for example, where we have tuples of elements, say the minimum and maximum of some certain values. 
and we want to transmit this data to another rank, but we only want to transmit all the maximum values, or we only want to transfer the minimum values. How do we do that? At the moment we can't do that. We now have some struct information and we could come up with a really strange way of encoding this inside a struct, but don't worry, MPI has capabilities for doing that in a smarter way. And uh, the second example I want to give here is sending, for example, the column of a matrix. Say you have some linear algebra problem like, um, I don't know, matrix multiplication or something else, a solver of linear equations. And for some reason of a two-dimensional matrix, you only need to send uh, the column uh, or specific columns, but not the entire matrix. How do we do that at the moment? At the moment, we can't. Um, if we are in C uh, with um, uh, dimension ordering, so to speak, or, or index ordering of multidimensional arrays, and uh, we want to transmit rows, we could try to compute this manually, but with columns it definitely doesn't work because there are gaps in between the elements, right? The, the gaps of the remaining elements of the same row. So what we intend to do is, or what we want to have is, do all of these operations. Transfer, for example, all the max elements of the top example, or transmit a single column of the bottom example, without having to copy the data ourselves first. Because that's something we can always do. We can always say, let's just take the data out into a contiguous buffer, transmit it, and on, then on the receiving side, unpack the data again into whatever structure it was originally, and then continue to work with it. But we want to save this overhead in coding, we want to save this overhead in memory footprint and so on. So what you can use for that are vectors in MPI. Because these vectors support strides, which are essentially it's just uh, gaps in arrays. And um, you could, for example, specify the example on the right where I say I want to transfer of my entire array two elements at a time at a stride of three, so whenever I select two elements, the third one should be omitted, then again two, the third one should be omitted, and so on and so on. And I want three of those blocks in total, whatever is, uh, whatever comes after that, I don't care, I don't need to transfer, I'm only interested in the first three of these blocks, or six elements total. Um, and this is often useful, as I keep mentioning, for linear algebra. This is quite useful. So how can we do that with MPI? We can, uh, as I will show in this example, use the MPI type vector call. And notice this is where I drop uh, specific API discussions because uh, it should be quite easy from now on. Uh, first of all, we define a size, which is the overall size of our array, which is 20. We have a stride of 3, a count of 3, and a length of 2. Which means we want uh, the stride to be every third element. Uh, we want to transmit three blocks and every block should have a length of two, which means two consecutive elements. Because our stride is three, the next third element we will drop, we will not transmit, and then we will start all over again and we do this three times total because we have a count of three. And uh, we give these parameters to MPI vector. Again, you could just put the um, integer literals directly into the function call, but please don't do that. Whether you use macros if uh, you're if you have a really small code example, or if it gets more complicated and you want to make sure that you scope variables correctly, then you use uh, integers, const integers, const expr integers, statics, whatever. Just make sure that you don't put integer literals directly into your code without naming them, because that doesn't tell anybody else what they're supposed to mean. If somebody is not that well versed in MPI, but they still need to debug your program and get into it, it makes it quite difficult. Also, the same applies to me. So whenever I see MPI type vector, I don't know by heart if I first specify the count or length and the stride and the count comes as the third parameter. I don't know something like that by heart. Why should I? There's an API for me to read up on, right? There's just a reference that I can check on the internet, for example. Um, however, if I just name them, as I did in this example, I don't have to know. If I assume that the programmer didn't mix it up, I immediately know the first parameter needs to be count, uh, the second needs to be length, the third needs to be stride. So, um, continuing on, after we created this type, we commit it. Uh, then we can actually use it for transfer operations, for message ex exchange. And we allocate uh, um, a character array data of the overall size. And then we do the send operation where we say, I want to transmit a single element of my type, my type. And a single element in this case then means I will get um, three blocks of uh, each length two with the third element missing. And MPI is going to figure out a smart way of transmitting that. And on the receiving side, obviously, I'm just going to do the exact same thing if I want to receive the exact same data. Uh, now, 
focusing a little bit more on the receiving side, remember that I told you it seems to be a bit superfluous that you have to specify sending and receiving types and counts and so on because uh, it should just be the same and uh, one reason for not doing that is because it allows you to reinterpret the data. It allows you to send uh, a bunch of uh, floating point numbers uh, and receive it as a single array of floating point numbers or something like that. So on the next slide you actually see a practical example of using that because what you can do is you can for example send the data always as I showed it in the previous slide and if you receive it with the code that you see on the left you will get the exact same structure on the receiving rank. If you receive the data with what uh, the code on the right shows, so not my type, but I receive actually MPI character and I receive a bunch of characters, namely count times length, which is the overall uh, size of the array um, uh, that, should, that I want to have in the end, what I get is a single array that contiguously has all this data that I wanted to transfer. I don't have these missing parts. Because if I choose the code variant on the left where I receive using my type, the gaps in my array in the, in the out buffer, they will not be written to. So they are undefined. They will not be initialized unless it's some uh, more complex C++ structure that is initialized anyway. MPI receive is not gonna write to this data for me. Um, if I choose the code on the right, however, I get a contiguous representation of the elements I wanted to transfer and uh, I know that I don't have to worry about uh, which parts are missing. And there are use cases where you want to choose uh, the communication pattern on the left or rather the, the um, sort of receiving data structure on the left and there are use cases where you want to choose uh, the variant on the right. It really just depends on what you want to have in the end. Um, there are some other things that you can do with this, uh, some really cool things like data transposition for example. Say you want to transfer the column of a matrix but uh, on the receiving side you don't want to allocate uh, the um, entire two-dimensional array because you're only going to need those numbers and you're doing a simple operation like computing the sum or the product or whatever. You can just receive them as a single array and you don't need to do any special transposition or something else. You're going to get a single array with all the column values transposed and you can immediately work on this in C without having to jump over non-existing elements for example. So this can be quite handy. Now moving beyond contiguous data types, I told you there are um, two, or actually vector data type uh, rather, uh, there are two more data types that we want to talk about. The next one is subarrays, which uh, I already hinted at that uh, it allows you to address subranges of your array. And um, assume in this case we have a two-dimensional array, you just want to select a certain block. Uh, the only thing you have to do is specify what is the starting point, what is, what is the size in every dimension and then just transfer this kind of information. On the next slide for this you will see an example. Again we create our own data type my type. Uh, we um, need to specify several characteristics. First of all the overall size of the entire thing, of the entire domain. Then sub size which is the size of just one of this sub array that I want to transfer and the starting point. And all of these arrays have two entries because in this case I'm uh, considering a two-dimensional domain. You could also do this in 3D or in 1D for example. Just need to change the number of, of um, elements of your arrays. And then we call create subarray with two dimensions in this case. The overall size, the size of the subarray and where it starts. And then uh, also specific to this function we need to uh, specify which uh, index order we use because uh, you probably discussed this maybe in algorithms and data structures or some other subject that um, C and Fortran for example have different ordering so people like to call this uh, column major or row major which is sort of confusing because if you have a matrix um, and you have X and Y dimensions there is an isomorphic projection from one thing to the other right you can just flip it and uh, or transpose it and then the fastest changing index is again the correct one so what uh, or the, the, the say columns and rows so what I rather like to consider this as is what is the fastest changing index if I have loops i and j for example to iterate uh, over a two-dimensional array is i or j the fastest changing index and this is different uh, for c compared to Fortran for example and that's the reason uh, why MPI allows you to specify that because MPI also has a strong um, has strong ties to Fortran, has a long history being used also in Fortran codes because Fortran has been used for science uh, and scientific computations since I don't know the 50s probably. I think the oldest Fortran version is from 54. So 
1954, which is pretty old. And uh, for that reason, we can also specify that here. And again, beyond that, just the data type and uh, the basic data type of the elements uh, and my type, which is then the new handle that I can use. And um, just a small detail here, in this case, we're talking about integers, for example, because MPI int specifies that we have integers as the element type. But as I said, you can also nest derived data types. So there's nothing that prevents you from, for example, creating a MPI vector of non-contiguous data and use that as the element type for a subarray that you want to transmit. That works. Um, after we are done with creating the type, we commit it so we can actually use it. And then we do our send receive operation with our uh, new type, my type in this case. Um, and uh, in this case, for example, as you can see on the send side, I use my type. On the receiving side, I don't. On the receiving side, I receive integers and I don't receive a single element, but I actually receive subsize squared, which should already hint to what's going on. Uh, the next slide again details this as you've already seen in a previous example. If I receive multiple elements, uh, subsize squared or integers in this case, I get uh, what you see on the right. You get just exactly the array that was transmitted. And if I receive uh, using the code that you see on the left, uh, what you get is again, you receive it into a buffer that uh, must be the overall size and only the orange part will be written to, which is the data that you just received. Again, depends on the use case. It might be that the remaining data, for example, is added uh, later on. Uh, it might be that it's initialized before already, whatever use case you might have. Now, these things open up a lot of possibilities, actually, in MPI, because assume now that we want to transmit um, columns or rows of a matrix. How do we do that? Well, first of all, for rows, we could um, allocate it as a 1D array, everything, and just linearize indices ourselves. So don't use multidimensional arrays, but we just use a single dimensional array, even if we, if we talk about 3D or 4D, and we just do the index computations manually ourselves. People like to do that a lot. Um, if we pick that variant, that's not the only thing we could do. We could also use multidimensional arrays, but let's first stick to the 1D array. You can do that and then use also a 1D MPI vector with strides, for example, in order to just distribute rows. Um, alternatively, you could also create a sub-array uh, with one dimension or you could use a D-array with one dimension. I didn't talk about D-arrays now. Um, they're not on the slides. They're just a little bit more generalized compared to sub-array, which allows you to transmit different chunks to different ranks. So with sub-array, um, whoever uses this type had always considers the same chunk because every subarray type has the same size and the same offset information. And with the array, this is not necessarily the, craze, uh, the case. This is sort of similar to the gather operation or the, the scatter operation where um, you send the same number of elements to everybody and the gather V or scatter V operation where the number of elements per rank can differ. They're sort of similar, the relationship here. Um, those are three variants you can use, for example, and this is only when you use 1D arrays. Say you actually use n-dimensional arrays because you actually use multi-dimensional arrays in your code and you do, don't linearize the indices yourself, uh, which, by the way, if you compile it in C, will just end up as exactly the same code. It's just syntactic sugar that allows you to do something um, in, a, in a more readable way. Um, you could, for example, use nested one-dimensional MPI vectors for that. You can, again, use n-dimensional subarrays for that, or you could use n-dimensional d-arrays for that. Whatever version of these six versions available you choose, you get the same functional result. For all of the above, you get the same data that is transferred. But the performance might differ, because remember, with MPI, you do not have any guarantee on performance portability. What you get with MPI is functional portability in the sense that MPI makes sure if you have an MPI implementation that adheres to the standard and if you write source code that adheres to the MPI standard that uses this library, then uh, whatever the standard says is exactly what will happen. It doesn't tell you that it's going to happen fast. It doesn't uh, tell you that it's going to happen slow or something. And there might be a performance difference between some of these uh, choices here depends on your implementation, depends on your uh, MPI implementation, depends on the use case of, of the code that you have, what kind of data you're transmitting, how large is the data, and so on. Depends on the MPI communication functions that you use to transmit this data. Um, it's a very dynamic, so to speak, problem.
Okay, we talked now about three of these uh, MPI derived data types that we um, had on our overview slide. The fourth one I told you is sort of a funny one, which is contiguous derived data types. Uh, because it's just like using a normal array. Arrays in C are contiguous. So um, why would you do that? I told you you could think about it. Maybe some of you have an idea. I will give the solution now anyway. Um, it's really just doing what a normal array transfer would be doing in C or C++. Um, using a send operation for example. But it allows you to send more elements than you could send with a normal send operation. Because you have to be careful, the count parameter type of all the MPI functions, send and receive and so on, this is only an integer. And an integer can only hold so many numbers. Namely, if it's an unsigned integer, it's uh, 4.2 billion or so. If it's a signed integer, half of that. Uh, if you want to send more elements than that, and there's really nothing that prevents you from using MPI to send, say, a terabyte of data, if you have the main memory and if you have the time and so on, why, why should MPI put a lower, an upper limit on, on the amount of data that you can transfer? But int max actually puts a limit on that because that's the count parameter type and I can't specify that I want to send more elements than the C data type can represent. And it might be even less than that depending on the hardware architecture that you work on because uh, the 4 billion is just a normal case that we're used to on modern x86 systems. This might not necessarily be the case for any or every system that you work on. And for this case, you can use MPI type contiguous, for example, to assemble a data type of um, a fixed size, say a million elements or something. And then you can send multiple of these contiguous type elements in order to get beyond this limit. This allows you just to sort of block or chunk your data. That's one purpose for using this or one reason why this type exists. The other is it allows you to also semantically group and name the data. For example, in this case, I just named the type again my type, which is a bad example, so don't do that. But what you could rather do is if you know that you're going to transmit position information, then just call the data type position type, for example. And whenever this appears in some send or receive operation, I know that this is position data that is transferred or whether it's some sort of request data, whether it's some molecule structures, uh, whether it's uh, temperature information, whatever you're transmitting, whatever application or domain specific information this holds, you can name it and use that to transfer data. And this tells you something about what's going on when you read the code later on. It saves you from using source code comments, assuming you need the contiguous type anyway, for example, because you're transmitting too much data. Um, now, those are all the derived data types we're going to talk about. However, if you do research on your own, some of you might have done that, you're going to figure out that there's also something called packing and unpacking. MPI offers you the capability to pack data type into contiguous memory, as the MPI CH documentation calls it, which is sort of what we are achieving with derived data types as well. So the question is, should I rather use derived data types, which are possibly complicated to assemble, or I could just use pack at the sending side and unpack at the receiving side to get contiguous memory and use a normal send and receive? Should I prefer this over using derived data types? And the hint is that no, you should not. The thing is that pack and unpack require explicit copy operations. What happens here is that the data is copied from your non-contiguous data, because you have a strided vector, for example, to a contiguous buffer, so it can't be transmitted, and this, calls, um, this causes a footprint overhead, because you need additional memory, this causes time overhead, and this might not be necessary. So MPI might be able to actually access via pointers the individual positions in your array and really just grab the data that needs to be transferred, put it immediately into the buffer of your network interface card, for example, and just send the data out with no intermediate buffer in your main memory. Whether that's possible or not is up to MPI. It's up to the MPI implementation. But by using pack and unpack, you prevent something like that from happening. When you use derived data types, there's no explicit copy operation, and it's up to MPI to do that if it's possible. However, pack and unpack are still offered for compatibility reasons because derived data types are comparatively new. Uh, they didn't have this back in, I don't know, the 90s or so. And um, pack and unpack were the very simple and fast to implement solution to this problem, uh, solutions to this problem. Uh, later on, people added derived data types, but you don't want to deprecate these functions completely because then you're going to break compatibility with older applications, of course. That's why they are still there. 
but uh, if you ever consider MPI pack or unpack, make sure that these are really what you want to use and there's no derived data type way of doing what you ever want to do. So the last slide regarding data types um, is the freeing. I already mentioned it before, always free your data type uh, when you don't uh, need them any longer. This frees up the internal data structures with MPI for using the custom type. And remember, this doesn't talk about freeing the buffer that you use for transmitting data. This talks about freeing the buffer that holds the type information, the structure information, not your actual data, of course. Um, it reduces the memory footprint if you have large numbers of data types. So it's possible to assemble data types like that uh, automatically and in a sort of uh, pra uh, programmatically way. If you do this with X macros, if you do this with template coding and so on, it's possible to just um, create data types on the run. And uh, this uh, can really increase the footprint by a lot, but it might be necessary for your application. And when you free them, you make sure that you don't run into any boundaries or any limits. Uh, it facilitates debugging because uh, obviously if you allocate memory and you don't free it and you run Valgrind, Valgrind is going to complain that uh, there's um, there's data left or memory left. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to say is, you already know I omitted it, mo uh, omitted it in most of my source code examples for space reasons and um, any pending communication that you have in your code that uses this type will not break down, for example. So it can just continue. When you do a send operation that immediately completes, but it might be buffered, as you know. Remember, we talked about uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication. There are four different send modes. And whatever happens here, um, or also if you use non-blocking communication, you can free the data type, even if this kind of communication is still pending. Um, this is not an implementation error if you do that. OK. Moving on to virtual topologies, which is the second topic of today's lecture. Virtual topologies are a quite handy thing because they allow you to name MPI ranks and provide addresses with semantics. So what does that mean? I told you I want to, for example, have a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional domain and I want to make sure I talk to my left neighbor or I talk to my neighbor above me. I need to do some initially seemingly complicated operation, uh, really it's, it's uh, not that difficult once you get a head around it, uh, in order to compute my left neighbor or my right neighbor, but still this is sort of uh, quite verbose code, boilerplate code, I would rather just tell MPI send this to the rank left next to me or send this uh, to the rank right next to me. And virtual topologies allows you to do that because it allows you to sort of name MPI ranks. So you don't really get names, you don't get left, right, top or bottom, but MPI allows you to specify this should go to this neighbor of mine. You will see later on how this works. And it ensures a high level, level view of these MPI ranks beyond just a set of indices of rank 0 to n minus 1, but actually a more complicated structure that you can use to map your problem properly. And mapping the problem that you have to MPI ranks and mapping these ranks to hardware uh, correctly in the sense of doing it in a smart way is probably one of the most important things of, of uh, this entire prior programming exercise because it's easy to write or easy, say it's feasible to write a parallel program that computes the correct result. But in order to do it fast, in order to do it performance efficient, you need to know how do I split up my problem and how do I map the individual chunks of my problem to a rank and how do I map this rank to the hardware? Do I put this on one CPU, on the other CPU, on this core, on another core and so on and so on? Getting this right gets you a lot of performance, getting this wrong gives you a lot of bad performance. The functional aspect will not change. Your program will still compute the correct result if you get the mapping of your ranks wrong, for example. If you say that neighboring ranks that exchange a lot of data are not put on the same CPU but on different nodes, for example, this will not affect the correctness of your program. It will just sacrifice a lot of performance. And virtual topologies helps you to do this uh, in a better way by mapping exactly what your program looks like, what your, your problem looks like, and not having to do this manually. Um, maybe add this a small detail, uh, people like to call this virtual topology or actually the MPI standard also call this calls this virtual topology because it doesn't necessarily match uh, whatever the hardware is doing. So you could for example create a two or three dimensional uh, topology, a Cartesian grid, I will show you an example on the next slide, 
uh, that doesn't really represent what the hardware looks like in terms of how the network is connected, in terms of its network topology, and uh, that's why it's called virtual. But still it offers you a nice way of, of sort of structuring your ranks. And uh, yeah, the other bullets here I already mentioned, whatever you want to do, it should reflect the real world problem that you have. Uh, if I have a two-dimensional problem, for example, I want a two-dimensional topology and not something else. And uh, as always, remember, I keep mentioning this, if you give more information to MPI, MPI might be able to do optimizations. If you hide this kind of information from MPI and approach your problem as a sort of a black box, then MPI can't do anything about it. Now, there are two main types of topologies, according to MPI at least, in the MPI world. There are Cartesian topologies and graph topologies. So the difference is quite easy. Cartesian topologies are regular grids of squares, cubes, uh, what have you, depending on, on your dimensionality. And every rank is a node on your grid and it's connected to its immediate neighbors. On the bottom you have an example. I think we all know what we're talking about. Uh, boundaries can be periodic, so it's possible to wrap around. It's also possible to not wrap around. Uh, you will see on the next slides how this works. And ranks can then be identified once you have this kind of topology by simply specifying the coordinates rather than using a single index, which is quite handy. On the right, you see graph, a graph topology example, for example, which are really just generalized graphs. So you have vertex, uh, vertices connected through edges. Every vertex in the graph represents a rank and every edge represents a neighbor relationship, which means these ranks are neighbors and these might probably communicate at some point. And um, these graphs are even weighted. So MPI allows you to specify weights, uh, which uh, can be used, for example, to tell MPI that there are two ranks that will communicate a lot or they will communicate very often, for example, um, exchange a lot of data, uh, whatever definition of, of intense uh, communication you have. And there are some ranks where this is not the case, for example. They are both direct neighbors, but only one pair is communicating a lot. The other pairs also are also neighbors, but they communicate less. For that, you have weights. Um, there are really, really complicated patterns here that you can come up with because they're general graphs. You had some graph theory, I guess, in, in, your, in your studies, maybe in your bachelor. And uh, I'm not gonna go into more detail about this here because it probably um, exceeds the scope of this lecture and we're also not gonna need it in the, in the pro seminar. And getting these graph topologies right is quite complicated because it's a lot of code that you have to write because you have to enumerate all the edges obviously because that's the only way to formulate general graphs unless you have a more specific uh, structure. And if the structure is specific enough that it actually fits a regular grid, we just use Cartesian topologies instead. So let's move to the Cartesian topologies. Um, they have uh, several properties, just like the derived data types. Uh, in this case, I have um, a small figure that illustrates what's going on. Uh, first of all, on the left, you see we have um, a size, which is given per dimension, which is the size of your entire topology. Uh, then we have uh, the rank order, for example, which is important. I will show on the next slide. Uh, ranks might be reordered. Whenever you create a new topology, rank numbers might change. Let's leave it at that. On the next slide, you will see why this is important. Uh, we have the number of dimensions, for example. So you could have a Cartesian topology with two dimensions or with three dimensions or more. Um, then on the right, you see uh, the, the periodicity, which is per dimension, uh, which is the question of whether the top rank has uh, the very bottom rank as its top neighbor. If it is the case, then the, our domain is periodic. This makes sense for some uh, problems, for example, where you cannot simulate your entire problem space that you want to simulate, say um, a chunk of water on the ocean or a cube in our universe, and you want to uh, just uh, simulate what's going on, but you have to restrict yourself to a small portion of the space, then what you usually do is you take out a small chunk and you assume that you simulate a general behavior by having whatever flies out on the left side of your problem comes back in on the right side and you get this sort of continuous flow of, of uh, math properties. And periodicity allows you to do that. And uh, yeah, the last uh, note here is the rank um, at coordinates 4.3, which is exactly what these topologies give you. It allow you uh, they allow you to specify I want to select this rank now for sending or receiving data, for example. I don't need to compute manually what the rank number is or the rank index is. I just say at coordinates 4, 3. Now, when working with uh, Cartesian topologies, there are several things to consider and that we need to be careful about. 
First of all, whenever we create a topology, we get a new communicator, which is important. So we need to decide on the dimensions, as I said before, we need to decide on the sizes, the periodicity and so on. Um, and if you don't know, for example, what your dimensions should look like, you just know you have a 2D grid and you don't really care actually how this is distributed, you just know that 2D makes sense for your problem, then you can also use MPI dims create, which creates these dimension sizes for you. And essentially what it does is just has some very basic formula. This is up to the implementation how to do that. But most of them just come up with a very simplistic formula of uh, dividing a number by um, uh, by a product or creating a product uh, splitting and making sure that uh, all of the elements of your product are sort of the same, that you arrive at sort of a cubic um, structure. But uh, you don't have to do that. You can also just compute the individual sizes yourself, assuming that if you multiply all of them, you get the total number of ranks that you need to have. And um, the new communicator is important because if you remember the MPI basics lecture, all the MPI semantics are relative to a communicator or a group. Whenever you do a send or a receive or a collective, for example, all of them have the communicator as a parameter because every rank index is relative to a communicator or to a group. And um, for this reason, you should be careful. You get a new communicator with this uh, topology creation and you have to use this new communicator for, for the operations that you want to do. Uh, this is especially important uh, if you use collective operations, for example. If you use collectives and you keep working with uh, the old communicator instead of the new one with Cartesian topologies that you created, MPI might still do the same thing and functionally your program might be correct, but the performance will be worse and you will not get the benefit of actually creating these topologies. You will not get any MPI optimizations. Now, how do we create a Cartesian topology? Again, an API slide because uh, it's a quite new thing. Uh, we need to specify the old communicator we were using so far the number of dimensions total we have, uh, then dims, uh, although it's called dims in most uh, documentations and the, the reference, this is actually the sizes per dimension. Um, so for example, a four by three two dimensional problem. Um, then we have the periods, which is the periodicity. Serial means that uh, it's open. Uh, the top rank doesn't have any neighbor above it. And one means uh, no, in this dimension it's periodic and you need to specify this zero or one flag per dimension. Uh, then reorder, which is a flag that uh, tells MPI it should reorder rank numbers. If you do not reorder rank numbers, they will just have the same rank numbers as before. If you do reordering, then they will get uh, contiguous re reordering from zero to n minus one, for example, which might be different compared to what they had before, depending on what topology you created. And the out parameter com card, which is the new communicator that you created with this topology and that you should be using from now on whenever you want to refer this topology. And now I keep telling you that it's really nice to use Cartesian topologies because they establish this structure that you can use. Now, what can we actually do with this? How is this really useful? Well, the first example I want to give is shifting. What we can do is we can easily compute rank numbers of our neighbors because once we establish our topology, we just need to tell MPI which direction do we want to move in. Are we talking about the neighbor horizontally speaking or vertically speaking in this 2D case you see on the right? And we need to specify the displacement. Displacement. How far do we want to go? So with shifting and topologies, it's also easy to tell MPI, for example, I don't want to have my next neighbor, but the second next neighbor. If you need to do computations like that yourself, you can of course do that, but it gets increasingly complicated. MPI can do that for you. So on the right, you see an example of uh, 2D topology, uh, 4 times 4, which is partially periodic, so it has a, um, a periodicity in the horizontal direction, but not in the vertical direction. And uh, we can, for example, do an up-down shift with a displacement of 1, and then we get the immediate neighbors uh, on top and below of, of our rank. So the rank we're talking about currently is the blue one. I guess this is obvious. And um, if we do a left-right shift with displacement 2, for example, we get for the, for the right shift um, the second next neighbor on the right. And for the left shift, we get exactly the same rank. Why? Because we are periodic in the horizontal and uh, we move uh, one rank further than we actually have available. So we end up with the same rank. And this is perfectly correct. Depending on what you want to do, this might be uh, what you want to have in your use case. Now, how does this shifting work? This is the function signature. 
uh, we again specify the communicator, then we need to specify which direction, which is just uh, the dimension along which you want to select neighbors, then uh, the displacement, which is how far you want to go, and then you have two out parameters, rank source and rank destination, which uh, give you information on uh, which ranks you relate to in terms of this distance and this direction. So if a rank uh, gets a certain rank source and a certain rank destination, if a rank calls this card shift and then I get one source and one destination, uh, destination is the neighbor for myself. So if I want to move two below, then destination will be uh, where will this destination be if I want to move two below. And rank source tells me who sees me as the neighbor with uh, distance two, for example. Which is important because we need this for receive operations. If you remember, for send operations, it's quite simple. I need to know who I'm talking to and who I want to send data. But if for receive operation, I might need to know who needs to send me data and rank source allows to compute that. Rank source gives me the number of the rank uh, for which I am the neighbor. And uh, here's just an example, not sure it's necessary. Um, if we shift uh, along dimension zero with a distance of one and uh, we get the out of in source and destination, we will get the rank numbers that you see uh, as code comments on the left. For rank one one, for example, we would compute that the source is one zero because one zero says one one as its neighbor and uh, the destination is uh, one two. Okay. Now, that's one thing you can do, shifting. Uh, there's a second thing which is quite neat, which is slicing, uh, which allows you to cut your grid into slices. Uh, you create a new communicator every time you do that. So again, be careful that you're using the correct communicator because that's one of the easiest mistakes to get wrong in MPI, to create topologies, to create groups, which we're gonna discuss in another MPI lecture. And then when you do communication, you don't really get what you thought you would get. It's a deadlock, wrong data or whatever, until you figure out that you've been using the wrong communicators. After you created them, you just ignored them. So um, what slicing allows you to do is it allows you, for example, to do collective communication just along a certain dimension of your multidimensional problem. Uh, on the right, again, you have a two-dimensional topology and we could do a slicing, for example, along the horizontal axis. What we get here is our four communicators. I just named them here A, B, C, and D. And every uh, communicator has, uh, every of, of these four communicators has four ranks. And if I do a broadcast in A, only the ranks of A are involved. And this is correct in the sense, if you remember, collective communication operations need to be called by every rank, I told you. If you, they're not called by every rank, then you probably get a deadlock and your code is malformed but it's only every rank of the communicator that this collective refers to. Since in this case, we're creating a new communicator that only consists of ranks A, B, C, and D, for example, or, or D, uh, then if we only involve rank A, uh, or all um, uh, ranks in, in communicator A, then all the ranks in this communicator are involved and it's a perfectly legal collective communication operation to do. Now, how does this work? We can use the MPI card sub operation for that, um, where we specify the current communicator and notice that this must have Cartesian topology. So if you do not specify um, a communicator that has Cartesian topology, if it's a graph topology or if it's something else, then uh, you will get an error depending on your MPI implementation. You might also just get some segmentation fault, a crash or undefined behavior. Uh, most MPI implementations are nowadays um, say nice enough uh, to actually offer um, error information on that. I think we're going to have a few slides on, on errors and debug in NPI in a, in a few, uh, in, in another lecture, in a few weeks. Uh, but uh, depending on your implementation, you might not have that, so just be careful. I think current versions of OpenMPI tell you if you try to do a card sub on communication, uh, on communicators that are not uh, Cartesian. Um, yeah, and the second parameter um, are the dimensions that you want to keep in your subgrid, in your slicing. Uh, zero means drop it, one means include it, and then a uh, new com is just a new communicator that holds ranks of this slice only. And then you can use this new communicator, for example, to do a broadcast operation. 
And notice that the remain dims is quite generic because it allows me to specify which dimensions I want to keep. You could also create slicing of a 3D problem where you end up uh, with a 2D subdomain, for example, and you do broadcasts uh, along the 2D subdomain. And that one you could again uh, uh, splice, uh, slice and do, um, do a 1D broadcast, for example, or co whatever collective communication you need. Okay. Beyond these functions, there are additional details um, which are quite nice uh, to mention. I'm just putting them out here shortly so you know they exist. If you want to use them, please uh, read up on them, uh, how they work. Uh, but uh, sometimes it can be sort of difficult to get to know what's out there and what do I use it for, how it works and how do I use it then, I can read up on my own. But first somebody needs to tell me that this is actually available, this exists. Um, the first thing is MPI card cords, which simply allows you to compute coordinates from a given rank. So if I have a rank index 17, um, I can give this information to card cords and it will compute, for example, in a 2D, it could be uh, a 2D problem, it could be um, coordinates 4, 1. So this uh, computation I can, I can offlay to uh, MPI. And also vice versa, there's MPI card rank, which allows me to convert from coordinates to rank indices which I need sometimes if I still want to do uh, rank computations uh, with uh, certain with certain indices myself, for example, if I want to move along the diagonal or something, which is a little bit more difficult with neighboring uh, relationships in MPI, uh, then I can just compute the coordinates manually and then convert them to rank IDs. Um, there is MPI card sub, which allows you to partition your grid into lower dimensions. And uh, there is a card dim get and a card get, which allows you to get topology information for a given communicator. So at some point, your programs might be complex enough um, to be sort of generalized and you don't know exactly uh, for, um, for a communicator, for, for a sub-slice of your Cartesian grid, uh, how many dimensions does this thing actually have? Is it now 1D or is it 2D? Because this could be dependent on input data or some other property, and if you use these functions, then MPI can give you information about the communicator that you are using. Okay, so this was everything about um, derived data types first, and now uh, we talked about uh, virtual topologies. And I promised you a slide on uh, Tales from the Pro Seminar, as I like to call it, where I discuss current issues that students had. Uh, maybe something was not clear, maybe something required a little bit more um, illustration or visualization, which I can't do uh, on the fly in the pro seminar, for example. And whenever that happens and I have enough time, I like to create slides for that, maybe draw a little picture or something and try to explain what's going on, uh, assuming I still have time. And today we're quite fast in the lecture, so um, yeah, makes sense, I guess, even though uh, this is going to finish sooner than you expected, I guess. Anyway, uh, for today, from Tales from the Pro Seminar, we're gonna talk uh, about verification and validation, which is something that you did not stumble across yet. Some of you might. I'm pretty sure it will come up in one of the next Pro Seminars because people like to confuse these. Um, they are often used synonymously where people say, yeah, I verified my code, it's okay. Somebody else said, I validated my code, it's okay. They mean the same thing and so on. And these are absolutely not the same. So verification means that you check your implementation, whether your implementation actually meets the specification, whether it adheres to the specification. Essentially what this means is that you check that the software output is correct compared to what you have on paper, compared to what you expected. Say that for some reason in whatever universe you live in, you say that the number of pi should be 5. Verifying that your program computes the correct result means you check whether uh, uh, pi is computed as being 5. If your program says pi is 5 and on paper you think that pi should be 5, then your program meets verification. It can be verified. That doesn't necessarily mean that this result is useful in any way. This doesn't mean that the result is correct in terms of mathematics, in terms of whatever you want to do with this information. It just says your program is running correctly and it's doing exactly what you implemented. There's no undefined behavior, for example. There's no randomness that you don't want to have. Um, it's computing exactly what you want it to compute. Validation, on the other hand, on the other hand means checking your specification. Validation means that you want to ensure whatever you specify, whatever you put on paper, actually meets the requirements of what you want to have. Uh, 
In our previous example, say we have a program that computes pi as being 5 and our paper says that pi should be 5. This will meet verification but it would fail validation because we know pi is not 5. Pi is 3 dot something. So validation would fail in this case because it doesn't really meet the requirements of using pi for example for computing the area of a circle, right? So in this case we check whether the output we get from our software serves the actual use case purpose that we want to have. Um, another example would be weather prediction for example where I have a weather model that is wrong. I implement this model in C and I get the correct but wrong result so to speak. Then the program will meet verification because it's computing exactly what my math model says it should compute but it would fail validation because it predicts that uh, today it should be sunny and 30 degrees and unfortunately it's raining and 10 degrees. So this is the difference between verification and validation. First of all be careful when you use those terms yourself and try to get them right. Um, when you talk to other people be careful because they might be using them wrong. Sometimes I confuse them myself when I talk very quickly without thinking about it uh, too much before. So sometimes I need to stop myself and go like, uh, oh yeah, verification was the thing where I compute the correct thing, but then it's wrong because it doesn't meet the requirements. Um, just be, sh be sure. I'm, I'm not even really focusing so much on you need to know exactly the verification term, what it means, and exactly the validation term, what it means. You just need to know the difference in the two concepts. It's like you don't know the vocabulary, but you know that there's a difference in the concept, whatever you want to name it. And if you want to talk to somebody and they confuse it, it's not necessarily necessary to know what verification and validation means in terms of the words. You need to be able to explain to the person what the difference between those two concepts is. Okay. Uh, summarizing today's lecture, uh, we talked about derived data types and that they can be very handy because we don't need to copy data that we want to transfer that might be strided, might be missing some parts, uh, might have, I don't know, less dimensions or whatever. We don't need to copy that data to basic contiguous buffers. So say arrays in this case, first ourselves, we can actually uh, just ask MPI, please send this data as it is. Um, we can use those uh, data types to, for example, easily transpose data. Say we want to turn a column of data of a 2D matrix into a row of data and we can arbitrarily nest those. I didn't show any examples of nesting on the slides, but it should be straightforward. For every element type, just don't specify a basic data type, but again a nested data type and this is exactly what you get. Uh, then we moved on to virtual topologies. Um, that allow us to add uh, semantic position information to ranks. They allow us to give structure to our ranks beyond just a simple linear index. Um, it makes rank uh, positions easily identifiable by allowing us to say this is the rank at a certain coordinate per dimension and I can uh, want to talk to my left neighbor, I can talk to my right neighbor, top, bottom and so on, be depending on the number of dimensions that you have. And it allows us to limit the scope of collectives um, because collectives still deal with the entire communicator but every time I slice for example a topology I get a new communicator and then I can only talk to every rank on the same row, every rank on the same column, every rank on the same slice of a 3D topology and so on and so on. And lastly we talked a little bit about verification versus validation uh, which is important uh, because uh, it's quite useful to know whether what you did on paper is wrong or whether what you did in paper is correct but just your implementation is wrong and to know the difference between those two in order to know where you should start debugging. And with that I close today's lecture. Thanks. <laughs>